So the boycott is finally over. Andrew Yang had a long outstanding beef with MSNBC. Dating back a couple of months, MSNBC has been leaving him off graphics. They've been calling him John Yang instead of Andrew Yang. And he's finally back on without them giving the formal on-air apology that Andrew Yang wished that they gave him. So me, I was a little confused to see that he actually ended up doing an interview with MSNBC, even though they didn't come out with a formal apology. And I'm gonna play the clip and let you guys see it and give you my reaction now. Before going into it, I gotta say, and after watching, I'm like, whoa, they're not apologizing on air, and they're really aggressive in all of their questioning, but I think I see the genius of what Andrew Yang um, is going for in this interview, and I think you will as well, so we're gonna play it, so sit back, relax, and enjoy, Flake Crew. Well, it's been sort of a part of the platform. Uh, oh, let, let's, let's rewind it. Sorry, I, I was getting so excited, I watched it a bit early. Uh -huh. Democratic candidate for president. It's good to have you. Chris, great to see you. Happy holidays. Thank you for having me on. Okay, so I want to talk about health care. The, the first, this has been obviously the subject of a lot of debate. You've talked about it in the debates, you've talked about it on the campaign trail. But I'm slightly confused about your position. The first ad that your campaign ran uh, uh, was with your wife and talking about your son. And she says that you would fight for Medicare for all. It's been sort of a part of the platform uh, along with the Freedom Dividend, which we'll talk about. You recently put out a healthcare, uh, some language on your website where you say you support the spirit of Medicare for all, which leaves me slightly confused about what actually programmatically you would want to see happen. First, before Andrew Yang answers, notice how aggressive my man is. Chris Hayes looks like he came for blood. He came for vengeance. He remembered all that beef that Andrew Yang started. So look at how aggressive saying we're not friends. Look at this inconsistency here in Dear Here campaign. Let's see if Andrew Yang responds well. Well, what Medicare for all means to many Americans is universal health care that's high quality, and lower zero cost. And that is exactly what I'm championing. We need to provide health care to all Americans, but I would not get rid of all private insurance plans immediately because millions of Americans are on those plans, enjoy those plans, in many cases negotiated for those plans in lieu of higher wages. The goal of the government has to be to demonstrate that we can outcompete the private insurance plans and squeeze them out of the market over time. So, so is that something along the lines of uh, positions taken by, by Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, and a few others in which there would be essentially the availability of buying into Medicare for, for people? Yes, it is quite similar, but our plan has lower minimal cost for many Americans and then co-pays just so that you have a little bit of skin in the game. So it is similar, but we think that we've improved upon some of the other proposals that are out there. The other Man, honestly, healthcare is such a massive issue. And I love candidates like Bernie, but you, you can't just get rid of all private insurance. Like, that's chopping away how much jobs in the economy. Andrew Yang has the right approach of literally making sure the government has a plan that is better and has to, in a sense, compete with private insurance. Good on you, Yang. Good answer. Let's keep going. Other big, uh, the other big issue that you've talked about and I think has been some, one of the kind of engines of your campaign for a while, I think it was the thing that you were known for is uh, uh, some version of the universal ba basic income. You call it freedom some dividend version. of $1,000 uh, a month. There's a lot of people who are, there's two, two questions about that. One is sort of confusion about how that interacts with other things the government does, the earned income tax credit or other benefits, for instance. Like, would those go away and be replaced by that, leaving someone worse off? And second of all, the question of, you know, for people that are in dire poverty or really have problems with, with, with low income work, that's not enough money. Uh, so the last thing I would ever do is take something away from Americans or leave someone worse off. The freedom dividend is universal and opt in. And if you decide to opt in, you would be foregoing certain cash and cash like benefits that do not include health care, do not include housing vouchers. When I talk to Americans around the country, those who are receiving government benefits often are very anxious about losing those benefits. I love the earned income tax credit, but 30% of Americans who are eligible for the earned income tax credit don't actually receive it because they don't understand how to file for right. it. And there are massive timing of payments issues because if your car breaks down now and I tell you you're going to get a tax refund next spring, it doesn't help you get to work. So I would never do anything to leave Americans worse off. We have to build a foundation or a floor that elevates us all and starts to move us forward in the 21st century because we're going through the greatest economic transformation in our country's history right now. Let's talk so you can see what's going on here. 
And I understand finally why Andrew Yang did this interview and in this spirit of enemies, because MSNBC, if you didn't know, is like one of the biggest cable networks. It's Dumb and Fox basically running everything. Of course, CNN is kind of up there, but MSNBC, they're the big chihuahuas, right? They're the big golden retrievers, right? They're the big bulldogs, right? Andrew Yang knows that they're going to bring up the biggest criticisms of his campaign. And guess what? In this nice little seven minute segment, you have Andrew Yang answering the biggest misconceptions of his campaign. And he's doing it to an audience that has never heard of him or barely heard of him and has probably thought of that stuff themselves. So think about how genius is. Now you're seeing UBI, that's not going to give people enough money. Earned income tax credit. We already have that. He answered it right on the nail. Earned income tax, you get the refund maybe only once a year. Maybe you don't even get it because you maybe you make too much money that year. You don't qualify. And, you know, that money you can't really plan for in the first place. Hence that broken truck example. He hits everything right on the nail and we're going to keep going. So look through it this interview in that lens of Andrew Yang answering the biggest misconceptions all in one concise seven minute package. And you'll see the genius of this interview. About that, you talk about uh, the sort of threat of autom- automation, um, and and I think you connect that in some ways. And there's a lot of people I think who who, who have a similar school of thought. Some people have written about UBI in other contexts that automation uh, is going to take away a lot of people's jobs in the future. It's going to get progressively uh, uh, more ambitious in what jobs are automated. You know, the counter to that, and Paul Krugman wrote this up and other people said it, is that that threat has always loomed at every moment of industrial development. And there's something called a lump of labor fallacy, right? The idea that there's like a set number of jobs and if the robots or the machines or the factory uh, machines take some of them, there's less for everyone else, which has not borne out to be the case. Why do you think it's different this time? Well, the rate and pace of change and the scope of technology is much, much more extreme this time. It's going to impact many more parts of the economy than past transitions. I'm here in South Carolina, and they lost 90,000 manufacturing jobs. Now a third of their stores and malls are closing, and being a retail clerk is still the most common job in our country. So we have to recognize that, yes, there are going to be many new jobs that get created, but these jobs are going to tend to be for different people with different skills in smaller numbers than the jobs that are being lost in communities around the country. But isn't that partly just a question of like labor bargaining power and, and, and also a little bit of redistribution, right? I mean, like there, the, there was no reason that, uh, for instance, car, making a car was a, a good middle class job until the UAW unionized and basically made it a good middle class job. It seems like there's lots of jobs that might get created. And the question about how much power workers have over their wages ends up being really the determinant one. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head where unions have been this massive force for better compensation and benefits, but union membership has declined by 50% over the last number of years. And as a result, most Americans are not benefiting from that kind of collective bargaining power. If you put this foundation of $1,000 a month into workers' hands, it actually makes workers much, much harder to exploit and push around. And this plan that I'm championing is not originally my plan. Andy Stern, who used to be the largest labor union leader in the country, proposed this as a response to automation in his 2015 book, Raising the Floor. And so this idea has been with us for a long time. It's just overdue that we actually put it into law. Okay, uh, final question I want to ask you about your trajectory here and your relationship to the Democratic Party. It seems to me that, that from the folks that I meet that are uh, supporters of yours and people online, that you're reaching a lot of people who haven't traditionally either been involved in politics or part of the Democratic Party. How do you view your relationship to the Democratic Party? What do you view as your, your role in a larger sort of ecosystem of the party in whose primary you're running? Well, thanks for asking, Chris. I've been a registered Democrat for a long time. I served as an honorary ambassador in the Obama administration. To me, the Democratic Party needs to try and dig deeper and figure out how we're going to solve the problems that got Donald Trump elected. But I've been a loyal Democrat for years. I'm just trying to provide new energy and new ideas to the Democratic Party to help us all move forward in the 21st century. I would certainly never do anything that would increase the chances of Donald Trump becoming Uh, president again or staying president. And I'm thrilled that I'm bringing independents and libertarians and disaffected Trump voters into the fold. That's how we're going to grow the Democratic Party and that's how we're going to beat Donald Trump in 2020. All right, Andrew Yang, who is in South Carolina where he's campaigning, running for president. Uh, Thank you so much for making. So as you see this video, it does a phenomenal job 
of getting through every big misconception about you know Andrew Yang's platform and his campaign. And there's this beautiful thing about media and storytelling, right? And if you think about the story arc of Andrew Yang versus MSNBC, you know, this beef and this rivalry, um, knowing how people view you negatively, Andrew Yang has used this opportunity that like, oh, all these people have all these misconceptions about UBI, misconceptions about me and my campaign. Let me tie up this story arc of our beef with MSNBC and end it on a positive note dispelling every single misconception to one of our harshest critics in the world. And because this is gonna be one of his most hyped up, anticipated reunions and interviews, it's gonna get a lot of traction. And I've already seen on Twitter, on Reddit, the older crowd and people who were kind of not really paying attention to Andrew Yang have really swung on this. So I wanna see how this is gonna Type out in the end, how this is gonna be in the end, but overall, I loved this video, but who cares about what I think, man? It's all about what you guys think. Let me know in the comments below. Did you think this was a smart move by Andrew Yang, or do you think he is, this is that feudal end of his campaign? Always remember to like, subscribe, and the best, most smartest investors are the uneducated ones because they never stop learning. We'll see you later, Flight Crew. We are out, baby.